and has authored or co-authored numerous books, including Cooperation Among Animals, An Evolutionary Perspective, The Altruism Equation, Seven Scientists' Search for the Origins of Goodness, Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose, which we heard about yesterday, and most recently, and what we're about to hear now, How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog, Visionary Scientists in a Siberian Tale of Jumpstarted Evolution. Lee is also the author or co-author of two textbooks, pretty widely used textbooks actually, Evolution with Carl Bergstrom, uh, co-authored with that, and Principles of Animal Behavior, a classic, what I think is now considered a classic book within the world of animal behavior. And then finally, just because I think it's kind of funny, I'll read you his, his own bio from Twitter. Uh, he defines himself as an evolutionary biologist, writer, New York Yankees fan, Seinfeld fanatic, something I can identify with, has a serious case of wanderlust, and most proudly, curator of world's finest Do Not Disturb collection. Do Not Disturb Sign collection. So, uh, welcome to okay. Dr. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian, and, and thanks to everybody here for bringing me. I've, it's been a delightful visit so far, meeting some new folks and seeing what they're up to and uh, touring the campus. It's, it's, been, it's been great. Um, you know, for anyone who came yesterday to my talk, Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose, I, I feel like it should sort of open with a Monty Python line, like now for something completely different, because this has absolutely nothing to do with what I was telling you about yesterday. Um, instead, for this talk, I'm going to open up with a question, which is this. Suppose that you could build the perfect dog. Right? What would be the key ingredients in your recipe? Well, you definitely want cute, maybe floppy ears and a little curly tail that wags in joy whenever you step into the room. You want smart loyal, and you definitely want unconditional love. The thing is, what I'm here to tell you today is you do not need to build that animal. Because for the last 60 years, a dedicated team of Russian geneticists in Siberia have been building it for you. The perfect dog, except, as you might guess from the title of the talk, it's not a dog at all. It's a fox, a domesticated fox. They built it in the minus 40 degree winters of Siberia. And more critically, they built it in the blink of an eye in terms of evolutionary time. Right? A hundredth of the time it took our ancestors to domesticate wolves into dogs. This is my friend, collaborator, and co-author Ludmila Trut. In about a month, Ludmila will celebrate her 87th birthday. And every day, including today, for the last 60 years, Ludmila has led what's come to be known as the silver fox domestication experiment. And for the last 10 years or so, I've had the privilege of working with Ludmila to try and tell the story of this incredible experiment to as many people as we possibly can in as many different languages as we possibly can. So I'm going to tell you about foxes that will melt your hearts and lick your ears, just like this guy did, five seconds after they put him into my arms in Siberia. But more importantly, I'm going to tell you about what is the gold standard experiment for understanding the process of domestication. And if you think about it, domestication is not only important in the general biological sense of being an extraordinary evolutionary phenomenon. But domestication changed our own evolutionary history dramatically. When we began domesticating plants and animals, human evolutionary history took a very different turn than it would have otherwise. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about the cutting edge science 
that was done. And in addition, we'll talk about some political intrigue that was associated with the experiment and even do a little bit of a love story for about five minutes later on. So this fellow here, Dmitry Belayev, is where it all begins. So in the late 1930s, Belayev was an undergraduate student at a place called the Ivanova Agricultural Academy outside of Moscow. And when he was there, because it was an agricultural academy and because he was studying biology, he had all sorts of interactions with the kind of domesticated species that you would interact with at an agricultural academy. And he studied genetics. And at the end of his time at Ivanova, he wanted to go on to study science. But like virtually every male of that generation, when he graduated in 1939-1940, he went and fought in World War II for four years. When he came back, he landed a job as a scientist at a place called the Central Research Laboratory for Fur Breeding Animals, also in Moscow. And they work with all sorts of fur breeding animals there. But the two most important by far were foxes and mink. And the reason these were so important was that in the early 1940s, the Soviet Union was pretty much starving themselves to death. Right? They were going through awful times. And one of the very, very few reliable sources of the Western income that they needed so desperately were the fox furs and mink furs that were being shipped over to the United States and Europe. It was while Belayev was at the Central Research Lab that he came up with the idea for the experiment that would eventually turn into the silver fox domestication experiment. And here's how it started. Belayev knew from his own interactions with domesticated species at the Ivanova Agricultural Academy and from his reading on the topic, including Darwin's classic book on domestication. Belayev knew that many domesticated species share a whole suite of characteristics. So in animals now, they tend to have things like floppy ears and curly tails. They tend to have really reduced stress hormone levels. They tend to have juvenileized facial and body features compared to their wild ancestors. Domesticated species tend to have longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. And they tend to have lots and lots of variation in their fur and coat color. Not every domesticated species has every one of those characteristics, but most domesticated species have numerous of those characteristics, so much so that that whole cluster of things that I just talked about today is referred to as the domestication syndrome. And Belayev thought about it, and when he did, he thought to himself, you know, this is really weird. Our ancestors domesticated animals for all sorts of different reasons. Some species, like horses, we domesticated as a form of transportation. And others, we domesticated as food sources. And yet others, like dogs, we domesticated for some combination of companionship and protection. Yet, regardless of what we domesticate them for, they tend to have floppy ears and curly tails and juvenilized facial features and mottled fur and all of those things in the domestication system, sy syndrome. Why? Belayev hypothesized that this is because the one thing that our ancestors always needed when they were domesticating an animal regardless of whether it was for transportation or food or protection, the one thing they always needed was to be able to work with animals that would not attempt to bite their heads off. And so Belayev hypothesized that selecting the calmest, tamest, most friendly to human animals was the key thing in the early stages of all animal domestication events. 
He further hypothesized that somehow or another, and he wasn't exactly sure how, all of the other traits in the domestication syndrome, the floppy ears and the curly tails and all that, somehow were genetically connected to choosing the most friendly, tame animals. And that's why we see all of the characteristics that we see across so many domesticated species. Belayev decided he would try and test these ideas in real time, working with the foxes that he now knew so well from his time at the Central Research Lab. And the idea at its core is really basic. What Belayev envisioned eventually was to have an experiment where he and others would test hundreds of foxes every year. And they would choose the calmest, tamest animals, the ones that were friendliest to humans, and preferentially breed those animals every generation. So foxes breed once a year, every year is a generation. And then Belayev would see, first of all, over the generations, was he getting a genetically calmer, tamer, friendlier animal? And was he, simply as a response to choosing on behavior and behavior alone, was he beginning to see the other characteristics in the domestication syndrome appear? And he comes up with this idea in the 1940s, late 1940s, early 1950s, but he's got a problem. And it is a big problem, which is that any experiment like this in domestication is an experiment in genetics. But at this time, it was essentially against the law to do modern Western Mendelian genetics in the Soviet Union. And the reason for that is this person here, Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was a charlatan, a fraud, a pseudoscientist who had risen up in not only the scientific but the political ranks of the Soviet Union by claiming that Western Mendelian, what at the time was modern genetics, was in fact bourgeois science being promulgated by wreckers and spies from the West. He claimed that an idea that already at that time was known to be wrong, an idea referred to as Lamarckian inheritance or the inheritance of acquired characteristics, even though everybody knew it was wrong, he claimed it was correct. And he made up data to make it appear as though that was the case. What's more, he argued not only was it correct, but it was more in line with Soviet philosophy. This allowed him to rise up in the scientific ranks, but just as important to rise up in the political ranks. And he became literally Stalin's right-hand man for science. This is Lysenko giving a talk at a meeting in 1948. One of these talks where he was claiming that Western genetics was being promulgated by spies and wreckers. When he's finished giving this talk, Stalin stands up and yells out, bravo, comrade Lysenko. Because of Lysenko, thousands of Soviet geneticists lost their jobs. Before Lysenko, this was one of the major places people came to study genetics. But because of him, thousands of people lost their jobs as geneticists. Hundreds were thrown into prison. And a few dozen were actually murdered by Lysenko's thugs for not standing up and renouncing Western genetics and saying that Lysenko himself was right about this idea that he had. So this is the environment in which Belayev is contemplating a large-scale experiment in domestication, which is a large-scale experiment in genetics. He knew how dangerous it was to think about such things. He knew more than most people did. Because one of those couple of dozen people that was murdered by Lysenko's thugs was Belayev's older brother, who was an up and coming star in the field of genetics. 
until he was murdered by Lysenko's people. But Belayev was a guy who received endless medals in World War II for bravery. And he personally was not afraid of Lysenko. He knew he'd have to be careful because the experiment he envisioned would involve lots and lots of people eventually. But he was going to try. And so he began by doing a little pilot experiment with a friend of his in Estonia at a fox farm. So there were hundreds of these fox farms around the Soviet Union breeding foxes for pretty fur. And he talks to one of his colleagues, a woman by the name of Nina, at one of these farms in Estonia. And he convinces her to do a little pilot experiment with him where they're just going to test a couple of dozen foxes every year. They're going to choose the calmest ones. And they're going to see, even after a few years, a few generations, are they getting calmer, tamer foxes? So they do this for five or six years. And it's tiny and nothing publishable. But it seems as though the animals are, over time, getting calmer and calmer, as you might expect if the experiment was going to work. So he begins to think he, that there really is reason to, to do a true large-scale experiment to, on this idea. And he gets his chance in 1958 when Belayev is, gets the job as assistant director of a brand new institute of biological sciences in Siberia in a city called Novosibirsk. So the institute that Belayev is at is part of a giant complex called Akadem Gordok or the Academic Village. In the mid to late 1950s, what happened was Soviet scientists working with the Soviet government decided to clear out a large chunk of Siberian forest and build a giant academic village that initially had about two dozen world-class institutes in science. Not only the biology group that Belayev was vice director of, but an institute of chemistry and an institute of physics and an institute of very early computer science where they brought in over those late 1950s, early 1960s, tens of thousands of people who one way or another were involved in the science there. So Belayev is going to move there to become vice director. And as vice director, he is going to have the money and the power to start a full-blown silver fox domestication experiment where he can test hundreds of animals every year. But what he's not going to have because of all the other things he's involved with, is the time to be the person who leads the experiment on a day-to-day -day basis. So right before he leaves Moscow to move to Novosibirsk in Akadem Gordok, he goes on the hunt to find a young scientist to lead this experiment. And to do this, he goes to Moscow State University which is not only one of the nice, one of the best, but one of the most beautiful universities in the world. And he talks to a colleague there who studies animal behavior, and he tells him what he wants to do. He tests hundreds of foxes, see if he gets genetically calmer animals, and, 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 and all the stuff that we've been talking about. And this colleague of his puts out the word. And one of the people that comes to interview for the job in late 1958 is 27-year-old Ludmila. The interview happened 60 plus years ago. When you talk to Ludmila and about it today, it seems like it happened yesterday to her. She remembers walking into the room where Belayev was. And the first thing that struck her was that immediately Belayev began to talk to her as an equal, explaining what he wanted to do. Now, you have to keep in mind that the late 1950s, Soviet science was very patriarchal. Senior scientists did not talk to young undergraduate women as if they were equals. But he did, and that really mattered to her. So he lays out the idea. What I want to do is test hundreds of animals every year. We're going to choose the calmest, tamest, friendliest one to humans and preferentially breed them. Then we'll see. Do we get calmer, tamer ones over time because of genetic changes? And do we start seeing all the other characteristics 
of a domestication syndrome appear. And Ludmila loves this idea. She thinks it's a brilliant experiment, plus she really thinks it would be incredible to move to this scientific oasis with tens of thousands of scientists migrating there and be part of it all. But Belayev calms her down a little bit and he says, keep in mind a couple of things here. First of all, even though Lysenko is not as powerful as he used to be in the late 19, so this is late 1950s, he's not as powerful as he used to be. If he decided to make an example of us, he could still throw us into prison. Ludmila knew that, anybody who studied this stuff knew that. But again, it was important to her that Belayev told her to take a second and think about that. And the other thing that Belayev told her was, I did this little pilot experiment in Estonia, and the results are promising. I, I think it's worth doing a full-blown experiment here. But remember, this is an experiment in domestication, right? It could take 10 years before anything interesting happens. It could take 20 years. She remembers him looking her in the eye and saying, it could take your whole life before something fundamentally interesting happens. But she was hooked, she wanted the position, Belayev liked what he saw, and he offered her the job. So six months later, Ludmila and her husband and their two-year-old daughter hop on a train from Moscow to Novosibirsk, which is no easy train ride, to begin the full-blown experiment. And Ludmila will tell you from day one, her motto in this experiment comes directly from the classic children's book, The Little, the, the Little Prince, where the fox tells the little prince that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. So Ludmila moves to Akadem Gordok, which is about 45 minutes away from the city Novosibirsk, to start the experiment. Now, initially, when she first gets there, there is no experimental fox farm to do the work. Belayev is gathering money and clearing out a space to have a large scale area for them to do the experiment right there at Akadem Gordok. But he tells her for the first few years, we're gonna have to start it somewhere else and then we'll move it when I get this all done. So for the first year, Lunmila actually spent most of her time traveling around the Soviet Union on trains, visiting all of these fox farms that are there to produce pretty furs and trying to find the perfect place to start the experiment. And she does eventually, and it's a place called Lesnoy, the Lesnoy Fox Farm. It is about an 11 hour train ride from Akadem Gordok, an overnight train ride. And, and Ludmila's plan is that what she's going to do is she's going to go down to Lesnoy four times a year, sometimes for a couple of weeks and sometimes for a couple of months to begin the full blown experiment. This place, Les Noy, is a cash cow for the Soviet government. At any given time, there could be 10,000 foxes at Les Noy. And Ludmila remembers that when she first went there and talked to the director there and said, here's what I want to do. I want to test a few hundred foxes for this experiment that we're doing to produce a domesticated fox. And the director just looked at her like she was nuts. I mean, why would anybody want to waste their time on that sort of thing when there's so much money to be made in breeding beautiful furs? But when Ludmila said, Belayev sent her, that was enough. And the director said, fine, you won't bother me. You can test a few hundred foxes. Just go ahead, just stay out of our way. So Ludmila begins the experiment. And the procedure, of course, it's changed over the last 60 years, but it, at its core, it's very similar to, to what we're going to see right here. So every day, Ludmila would get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, right, and she would go from cage to cage. Each fox is in its own cage. And she would test the foxes to see their reaction to humans, which was almost always her, although occasionally she had an assistant. And what she would do is she would score the foxes as she approached them, right? And so every, she would, in a given year, test about three or 400 foxes. And every fox would be tested twice, once when they were a pup and once when they were an adult. And each time it would go like this. She would score them on whether they were friendly towards her 
or aggressive towards her, her four times, both when they were a pup and then again when they were an adult. First she would score them as she walked towards their cage. Then she would score them when she stood by the closed cage. Then she would score them when she opened up the cage door. And then she would score them again when she put something, either a stick or a piece of food or her hand covered with a very thick two-inch glove into the cage. And for each one of those, she would score them on a scale of one to four, where the higher the number, the more friendly or calmer they were towards her, and the lower the number, the more aggressive they were towards her. So she'd come up with a composite score for a given fox for both when they were a pup and they were an adult. Then from all the hundreds of foxes, she would take the 10% of the males and the 10% of the females that had scored highest on this tame, this calmness scale, and preferentially breed them to produce the starting population for the next generation. And then when those individuals, she would test them that next generation when they were pups and then when they matured, going through the same process. And then she would choose the 10% of the males and the 10% of the females from that generation, generation two. And then she would do it the next year and the next year and the next year. Ludmilla describes the initial population that she worked with at Les Noy as essentially a bunch of fire-breathing dragons. Right? For the most part, most of the foxes were very, very aggressive. But there was some variation. There were some animals that scored high on that calmness scale. But in early on, the individuals who were scoring high were not especially friendly. They were just not especially vicious. Okay, so they might have been sort of more towards the neutral end of not being especially vicious towards her. Compared to everybody else, they scored relatively high. But even after just a couple of generations of breeding, she was beginning to see changes. She was beginning to see foxes like this one here named Laska, which means gentle, and another one named Kisa, who were, even after just a few generations into the experiment, they were calm enough that Ludmila could actually hold them in her arms, like you see here, giving her hope that the experiment really might yield important information over time. So every year, she comes back to Les Noy these four times doing what we've been talking about, generation after generation. Every year is a generation, right? So by 1965, Ludmila has to come up with a scale to rate these animals in terms of how friendly or not that they are. She's got the one to four scale, and now she's going to layer on top of that another scale. There are what she refers to as class three foxes. And these are foxes that are aggressive towards humans, and they never are in the top 10% of the males or females. They are never selected to breed for the next generation. Then there are class two foxes. These are like Laska and Kisa. They're calm enough that Lumila can handle them, but they're not really showing any emotional responses to her. The vast majority of the foxes that were in the top 10% came from class two, but there were a few foxes that were what Lumila refers to as class one foxes. These were animals that not only could she hold them, but they were friendly towards her. They would wag their tails as she approached their cages. They would whine and whimper the way that your dog does when you leave and they don't want you to. They would whine and whimper when she left. At the time, they made up maybe 1% to 2% of the population in 1965. So this is five years, five generations into the experiment. Today, they make up about 80% of the population. A year later, Ludmilla has to expand her scale and include what she calls the Class 1E, or the elite domesticated foxes. Again, a very small proportion then, very large proportion 60 years later today. 
Here's Lubila describing the elite foxes in 1966, so six generations into the experiment. This is when the first elite foxes appeared. In the sixth generation, Ludmilla says, there appeared pups that eagerly sought contacts with, with humans, not only tail wagging, but whining and whimpering, and licking our hand in a dog-like manner. All done, no training, no practice, no learning, all based on underlying genetic changes. What's more, some of the elite domesticated foxes were not only wagging their tails, they were wagging their curly tails at Ludmilla. Wild foxes do not have curly tails in the way these foxes did. But that's one of the traits in the domestication syndrome. And it's the first of the domestication syndrome traits that appeared in the foxes. Keeping in mind that all they ever do when they select who's going to breed and who isn't is test them on their behavior. But now the first of the domestication syndrome traits, curly tails, appear in the foxes. So a couple of more years go by, 1967. Now Lysenko is gone. He's no longer a threat. What's more, 1967 is when Belayev had now secured the space and the money and opened up an experimental fox farm right there near Akadem Gorodok. This is what it looks like on a nice day in the Siberian winter. Each one of these sheds houses about 50 foxes, each in its own individual cage. And at any given time, there could be between 500 and 1,000 foxes at the farm. And having the farm there uh, really changed the dynamic of the experiment, because it meant that Ludmilla no longer had to restrict her observations and interactions to four times a year, even if some of those times were months. Now, every single day, she and now a team of people could work with the foxes. But what was equally important to her was that when she was down at Lesnoy, Belayev was so busy, and it's an overnight train ride, that if he got down there once a year, that was a lot. And so she could only talk to him when she came back and to, to, to Akadem Gordok, but the foxes weren't there. But now she could talk to him anytime she wanted to. And Belayev could come and interact with the foxes anytime he wanted to. And what was really critical to Ludmilla was that if something extraordinary happened, she could call Belayev and he could immediately come over and examine it himself. And a couple of years after they opened up the experimental fox farm, one of these extraordinary things happened. And her name was Mechta or Dream. Mehta was the first of the domesticated foxes to display floppy ears her entire life. So here's the deal. In wild foxes, pups actually are kits. I just, I'll just call them pups here. They have floppy ears till they're about six weeks old. And then their ears shoot ramrod straight the way that you envision a fox in the wild. At six weeks, Dream's ears were still flopping. At two months, they were still flopping. At three months, they were still flopping. Ludmila now calls Belayev out to show him this. Another of the traits in the domestication syndrome, floppy ears strictly as a result of selecting on behavior and nothing else. Belayev comes out there, and Ludmila remembers him turning to her and saying, what kind of wonder is this? He would take slides of dream with him when he went around not only the Soviet Union, but now beginning to go around the world to tell people about this experiment. And Ludmila remembers that Belayev would come back from some of these meetings where he would show the slide of Mehta as, as evidence of what was going on. And he would tell her that their colleagues in the audience would literally accuse him of trying to stick up the picture of a dog puppy in the talk to convince them that the experiment was working. That's how much Dream looked like a dog pup. OK, so it's a 60-year experiment. I need to pick up the pace a little bit here. 
Five more generations go by, five more years, 1974, so the experiment is now, you know, 15 generations in. And all sorts of things have been happening. Every generation they're getting calmer and more friendly, yes. But now they were finding not only curly tails and floppy ears, but dramatically lower stress hormone levels. 50% lower stress hormone levels than wild foxes. Yet another trait in the domestication syndrome. What's more, by this time, they now had added a control group of foxes in. And the control, control group of foxes was tested exactly the same way as all the other foxes in the experiment, except for the control group, which, one, which individuals got to breed for the next generation was completely random with respect to their behavior towards humans. So it's a perfect control. Not only do the domesticated foxes show 50% lower stress hormone levels than wild foxes, they show 50% lower stress hormone levels than the control foxes. In addition, by this time, they were seeing things like this. Domesticated pups were opening up their eyes a day earlier than wild or control foxes did. Domesticated pups were responding to sounds two days earlier than the control foxes or wild foxes did. If you sit down with Ludmila over tea and she takes off her geneticist hat, she will tell you jokingly that when these things were happening, they used to kid around and say, it almost seemed as if the domesticated foxes could not wait to start interacting with humans. What's more, they were beginning to see yet another trait in the domestication syndrome. So remember, one of those traits was that domesticated animals have longer breeding season than their wild ancestors. Domesticated foxes were now showing this. Typically, wild foxes breed for about 10 days at the end of January, February. Domesticated foxes bred for about 14 days, two days earlier, two days later. They were also showing all sorts of funky variation in their fur co color patterns another trait in the domestication syndrome. So by this time, now Ludmila and Belayev are going to add yet another group to the experiment. There's the domesticated line, there's the control line, and now they are going to add a third line in. This line is again going to be tested exactly the same way on how friendly or aggressive they are, except in this line, the 10% of the most aggressive towards human foxes will be selected to breed. They added this group not so much because they were interested in, the in, in, in aggression, but because they thought the aggressive line might help them better understand their domesticated foxes. And that could happen in lots of ways. You could breed the aggressive foxes with the domesticated foxes and get at some of the underlying genetics. But what I want to focus on is the other reason they did it. So this is an experiment in genetics, right? But it's an experiment in a particular type of genetics called behavioral genetics. Because the thing that they're using as their criteria for who's going to breed is behavior. Okay. Anytime you do a behavioral genetics experiment, you're always worried about something. So Ludmila and Belayev and their whole team were as, was assuming that all of the changes that they've been seeing are due to underlying genetic changes. But when you do behavioral genetics, you're always worried that non-genetic factors might be influencing your results. So for example, in a behavior genetics experiment, you're always worried that maybe young individuals learn whether to be aggressive or friendly from their parents. Or maybe what hormonal cocktail you're exposed to in development in utero affects how you're going to behave when you are born. These are non-genetic factors, and you're always worried about them. The aggressive line is now going to allow Ludmila and Belayev and everyone to test for whether or not the results they're seeing are due to genetic changes or non-genetic changes. They're assuming it's genetic, but they need to do the test. So here's what they do. Even though no one had ever done anything like this before, Ludmila worked with about six pairs of foxes. Each pair was made up of two pregnant females, an aggressive female, and a domesticated female. Okay. Ludmila learned the detailed surgical procedures that allowed her to do something remarkable. 
So this is, the, this is a, the uterine horn of a pregnant fox. And you, so you can see you know, six or seven developing embryos here. What Ludmila learned was the technique that allowed her to transplant developing embryos from one uterus to the other when they were one week old. So it's much earlier than what you're looking at here. One week old developing embryos that were could only be seen in a tiny drop of water. She swapped half of the developing embryos from one of these females to the other. So after she did that, each of these females had both her own genetic pups in utero and these foster pups from the other type of female. Right? So the tame female now had a combination of genetic pups and these foster in developing pups, or these foster developing embryos, and the same thing for the aggressive female. This is the perfect thing to determine whether non-genetic factors play a role. If, when the pups are born, they behave like their genetic mother, regardless of what womb they happen to develop in, then you can feel really confident that what you're looking at here in this experiment are changes due to genetics. But if when these embryos develop and when the female gives birth, they behave like their foster mother, that suggests non-genetic factors. So I'm going to go a little bit faster here because I know we're, we, I, I, don't, I want to make sure we have time to do lots of things. So Ludmila and her whole team wait for these females to give birth. And as soon as the pups are able to walk, which is about two weeks old, Ludmila is there to watch how they behave towards humans. And I'm going to let Ludmila, in her own words here, describe what she saw. What you're going to see is her talk, what you're going to hear, Rita here, is Ludmila talking about the pups that an aggressive mother gave birth to, remembering again that half of them are her genetic offspring and half are these foster offspring. The results we're looking at for this single aggressive female hold true for all aggressive females. And it also, the same pattern holds true, true for, the, for the domesticated females. So let's see what happened. So Ludmila's there, two weeks old, first interactions with these pups, born to the aggressive female. Okay. So Ludmila says, it was fascinating. The aggressive mother had both foster offspring and genetic offspring. Well, that's the way the experiment was set up, right? Her foster tame pups were barely walking. But if there was a human standing by, they were already rushing to the cage doors, wagging their tails and trying to lick Ludmila's hands, just like a perfectly respectable domesticated fox would act. She, the mother, was punishing her foster tame pups for such, I love this phrase, improper behavior, because that's not the way a respectable, aggressive pup behaves, picking the pups up and throwing them into the corner. And what did the pups do but get up, start wagging their tails, walking towards the cage doors, trying to lick Ludmila's hands again? All right. now. What about the same female? What about her genetic offspring from the same clutch? Again, Ludmila's words. They retained their dignity, growling aggressively the same as their mothers, and ran to their nests. They behave like a respectable, aggressive fox does. Pups behave like their genetic mother, not like their foster mother. And this was a pattern seen across all the animals strongly suggesting underlying genetic changes. Now, I see people milling about out there, so I don't know exactly how much time we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, do, I'm, I'm going to skip through one little thing, a wonderful little tale that I wanted to tell you. But I, I, I think it's important, five minutes, to, to, to really give you a sense of some of the other dramatic changes that have happened. OK, so in the 1980s, Something remarkable happened. I mentioned that in the 70s, they had found that um, the, the, the domesticated females had longer reproductive seasons, about 14 days versus 10. But in the early 1980s, something really, truly unbelievable happened. 
in one year, some of the domesticated females went into estrus and were ready to breed a second time in September as well as in January. Ludmilla bred those fem domesticated elite females with domesticated elite males, and they produced a second cl clutch of pups. Absolutely unheard of ever in foxes, but typical to what you see in the domestication syndrome. All as the result of selecting on behavior and only behavior. By the 1990s, they were doing very sophisticated measurements of facial and body features in their domesticated foxes, in their control foxes, and in their aggressive foxes. And they were finding really stark differences. So if you think about a fox running in the wild and running around in the wild, one of the things you immediately think of is this long, pronounced snout. The domesticated foxes have a shorter, rounder, more dog-like snout. The other thing you might think about when you think about foxes running in the round in the wild are these, long, these thin, gracile limbs. Domesticated foxes are chunkier and lower to the ground than wild foxes or controlled foxes, foxes or aggressive foxes. They've been doing all sorts of interesting work on the underlying molecular genetic patterns. They have found, for example, that Many, not all, but many of the underlying genetic changes in their foxes can be localized to one fox chromosome, fox chromosome 12. That's kind of interesting, but the neat thing is people were asking the same sorts of questions about the underlying genetic changes in dog domestication. Dogs and foxes have different numbers of chromosomes, but fox chromosome number 12 was essentially spread across three dog chromosomes. And lo and behold, Many of the underlying molecular genetic changes associated with dog domestication happen on one of those three chromosomes. So even deep down at the molecular genetic level, it looks like they're mimicking what's going on with dog domestication. Last example, one of my favorites. In the early 2000s, they added a new component onto the experiment. So what happened was someone who specialized in animal communications and vocalizations came to Ludmilla, said, I'd love to study the vocalizations made by the foxes. Ludmilla says yes. She always says yes to that. And then she makes their head spin with how quickly she sets them up to do an experiment. This person, Svetlana Gogolova, comes year after year. She tapes 2,000 hours of the vocalizations made by the domesticated animals, the control animals, and the aggressive animals. And they make about eight different sounds. Most of the sounds are made by aggressive, tame, and control foxes. But there are two sounds that are only made by the domesticated foxes. And I want to focus on one of them because this sound is almost too perfect for a domesticated animal to make. And if we're lucky, you will hear the sound right now. Can you hear that? Barely? OK. That sound is the sound that is closest to human laughter that's made by any animal, period. So not only do you have cute animals that will lick your faces, but you have animals that will laugh with you when you're laughing. They'll laugh with you when you're upset and crying, because they're not <laughs> laughing, right? But it's almost too perfect. This is the trait they understand least, but they're working on it. So if you ask Ludmilla today, 60 years into the experiment, what her hopes and dreams are, what you'll, well, you'll get a, I got a six-hour answer. I'll give you the very brief version of it. The first thing Ludmilla will tell you is, I hope to be able to register them as a pet. Technically, these are still considered exotic animals. They live in the houses of about two dozen people around the world as pets. But because they're exotic, it's very difficult and very expensive to get them. But the experiment is still going on. And they have hundreds, thousands of foxes. They have plenty of foxes, domesticated foxes, to put in people's houses and keep the experiment going. And the, the other thing Ludmilla will tell you is one day I will be gone, but I want 
my foxes and the experiment to live forever. I do, I hope you do, and I appreciate you taking the time to hear this today. Thanks very much. <laughs>